All right, it is Wednesday afternoon. It is February 1st. We are one twelfth of the way through the new year already. <laughs> Time flies. We will be picking up verse by verse, word by word in chapter 16 of Genesis, but we've put down 15 because we're still talking about the covenant. The covenant really started mid-chapter. Uh, it's a little hard to pick where because as I go back and I'm even glancing and I was just asked, let's just say read 15 to, to study the covenant if that's where you need to. But where we left off last class, and there is so much that I was trying to push it in, I'm going to go back and review some and add in some new notes and hope I remember and cover everything. Yes, question. Uh, can you please tell me again who was the one, was it, who was the one that bought the land? For the son, was it Isaac or, or, or was it Jacob? That bought the land for the son. I mean, the cave where they came and, and married oh, Joseph. Oh, and okay. Who bought the cave of Machpelah where, where our patriarchs are buried? Okay, that would be um, Avram, Avraham, because he's Avraham by that point. Abraham bought Abraham. the cave to bury his wife, Sarah. Sarah. Okay, oh. That's where it started. Then when he died, his sons, Ishmael and Yitzhak, Isaac, buried him in that cave. And then we come down another generation, and Isaac and Rebekah were buried in that cave. Then we come down to the third generation, and Yaakov, Jacob, and his wife Leah are buried in that cave. But Rachel, Rachel, died on the way to Bethlehem, Beit Lechem, so she has a sepulcher all of her own. Uh, where she was buried. That used to be on the outskirts of, um, of uh, Bethlehem, but now it really is definitely Bethlehem because cities grow up. So <laughs> does that clear it up for you? Who were the last ones? Uh, Jacob and Leah. The one missing is Rachel. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's the cave of Machpelah. Sure. Sure. Okay. But we've got them alive right now. We, actually, we have Avram alive and Sarai alive, but we don't even have his first son yet. Okay, so we're going to back up. We're talking about the change from Avram to Avraham. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> okay, and the difference in the names is that H, because when you take the vowels out of the equation, since Hebrew has no vowels, that's what our difference is. So the Hebrew lettering for Avram is the Beit, which we get the B sound, the Resh, where we get the R sound, and then M, the moon, yeah, M, I'm trying to say it in Hebrew, that's an M, okay, um, Mem, where we get the M sound. So you hear the B, the R, and the M. Even though we have the markings that help us know how to pronounce it, we get the sound. In our English, you say Abram. In our Hebrew, we say Avram, because that's closer to it. Now, when we get to Avraham, we've got the Beit. We've got the Resh. We add in the Hay. And then we've got the mem. So the difference is right here. Adding that H sound, hey is a letter, but H sound. Now everybody, well I shouldn't say everybody, but a good many people get taught that Avram meant a high father, an exalted father, a revered father, a respected father, and, and they're right. Av, the beginning of it, is father or daddy. When we say Abba, we're saying daddy, you know, we're saying father, okay? Avram, the Ram, the last part, the Ram in the Hebrew root has that idea of an exalted one, one that's respected. Then they say that Avraham means that he goes from being the father of, uh, just being an exalted father, to now being a father of a multitude. And they say that's what it means. They draw that because the scripture tells us at the same time with the name change and all that's going on here that Avram is going to have offspring and he is going to have a multitude 
There's one seed in particular that's coming. This is the seed that we're concerned about. I'm concerned not in worry, but the one that matters because that's, that is Yeshua, the, the um, virgin-born son of God, son of man. And he's going to come through this line starting with Avram. So they look at that. They see that God promised when he saw the stars in the sky, God promised him a multitude of um, children that would come from him. And that is true. But if I gave you the words in Hebrew for a multitude, a father of a multitude, this is what you would get. You would get the name Ab. Okay, let me make sure I spell it right. <laughs> uh, where did it go? Where did it go? Hamon. Okay. It, you would get Ab, father, plus Hamon. Okay, so if that's what God was saying, is just, I'm going to make you a multitude, I'm going to make you a father of a multitude, then he should have called him Ab Hamon. Because Hamon is a big crowd. Hamon is a noisy crowd. You got a lot of kids, you got a lot of noise. <laughs> okay? But where do you see Ab Hamon in the name Abraham? You don't, do you? They're missing a key letter here. It wasn't Ab Ham and, and, and it got pluralized. It's Ab Ram. The Raish sound, the R is nowhere in here. So when they say that, they're taking away the R and they're adding in some other and coming to that conclusion. Now there's a secondary reason why I think they get to that conclusion. And that's what I started to tell you about last week at the end of class also. That a thousand years later from this time, not in the Hebrew but in the Arabic, there's a root that comes from R, H, and M in the Arabic that talks about being fruitful, being plenteous, plenteous however you say that word. And they say from that, that's the father of multitude. He's got plenty. He's got an abundance now. But that's Arabic, and that's a thousand years later. So that's not satisfying to this little Jewish girl who's saying, wait a minute, that's not what I see in my Hebrew. So we wanted to break down and see what do we see, what is the significance of the name change. And it is significant because this is coming at the initiation of a covenant. This covenant is going to see Messiah come from this covenant. So if God's saying, I'm giving you a sign about this covenant, we had the sign of the rainbow with the covenant God made with Noah. If God's giving a sign here, I want to know what that sign is. And I think it's going to be significant, and I don't think it's going to come a thousand years later in the Arabic language. So I got to dig in my Hebrew, and I got, I've got to see what I find. So staying with just this here, I'll come back and I'll explain on the other side, the H, what the He represents in Hebrew and all of that. But right now I'm going to stick with the name and see if I can find a root, a meaning, something from the Hebrew. And when we looked last week and we looked at the last three letters, because most Hebrew words come off of a root of three letters. And you add to those three letters the vowel soundings and the markings, and you get different words from that, but they have that same root. It's called the shorish. That just means the root. And you go back to the root to build meaning as you go out. Just like a tree, you've got the root, and then it springs out. So that's the idea. So when you do that, and you look at the letters, the, the, the three letters, if we do the last three, the resh, the he, and the mem, that would be like, in our English, the R, the H, and the M. We're leaving off that first B sound that's there. And we look at that, and we don't find any Hebrew words that are made from that root. Okay? Um, again, there's just nothing there in Hebrew. So, lacking there, then let's start the other way. Let's start with the first three letters. Let's start with, let's take the M off, and let's start with our B sound. Remember, we don't have the A, that's just a sound. We have the bait, the resh, and now we have the he. It's interrupting. We're, we're pushing the mem out now. We're looking at those three. Do we have anything from the Hebrew that's close to that B, R, H? 
and all of a sudden, ding, 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 we have something that ties in here. What we have a, a derivative from there coming off of the shorish in the feminine, and uh, I won't go into any more other than that because you have different layers, but trying to keep it simple, you can easily and quickly come to the word Brit, B-R-I-T in our English, but Brit in Hebrew means cutting. I'm sorry, means covenant, means covenant. When you hear about a Brit Malah, when the baby is eight days old, they have the baby circumcised and they have a Brit Malah. They're having this, this um, about the, the covenant, Brit. Um, it's in the form Bar Mitzvah also, again, derivatives. This is when the, the son becomes um, a man and is the covenants made with him personally now. Staying close to this, in the BR sound, we also have bara with the H on the end, um, B-A-R-A-H. This isn't the bara where God created out of nothing, but this word when we have bara uh, means, and I just lost it, where did it go? And my mind's short, I guess I'm spinning too fast. Um, Barar, I'm sorry, it's not the H sound, that's why I got off. Okay, if we go with Barar sound, the B-A-R-A-R, -A -R, that sound also has to do with cutting. Now, we know that the covenant we're going to see has to do with cutting. So I'm going to take you to that cutting in Hebrew and tell you, off of the Brit, which means covenant, we have a related word. It's not the same, but we have a related word. We have a cousin. And the cousin, when we have that B-A-R-A-H, we have a um, cutting. It's like a cutting into the stone. And we'd use the word maybe etching, but usually they use the word cutting. So they'll take this even. And if they want to say to cut a covenant, which is said in chapter 15 and in verse 18, we do have in the Hebrew there, that on the day that the Lord made a covenant, the Hebrew says on the day that the Lord cut a covenant, we have two words there. We have karat berit. Okay? So we have berit, and they did the word karat in front of it, which is definitely cutting. But again, the cousin to this word is bara, which gives us that idea of cutting also. Karat can be a cutting away something that's cut away, something that's taken away. So easily we can see in Avram, the name has something to do now with cutting, something that's being taken away. We have a covenant. We have something coming together here completely. Now the other thing that's very interesting is when we stick with the, the um, Bait, the Resh, and the Hay. The three letters that we see, we get Brit out of and Bara out of, and we have others also. We also see in this that there's another meaning. Often Hebrew words can have more than one meaning. We have some in English that do that also, that you have to know the context to know what's being said. And what's interesting is that out of the BRH can be to eat. Or to choose, as in you're choosing the best, you're choosing the select, you're choosing prime, USDA prime in, in our English, that idea. But the idea behind it when it's used, it was food that was brought to the sick to help them recuperate. So they selected prime food, specific food, with the intent of it bringing healing. Now, we don't see it in chapter 15 here. But there are sacrifices that when they were went through the ceremony with the sacrifice, they did eat the sacrifice afterward. It was roasted and they ate it. They had a meal and uh, they had fellowship during that meal. And it was um, to help build relationship, to help be um, a closeness, a coming together that followed after the, the sacrifice um, was was had been used in that ceremony now it's not always but there are some sacrifices that you'll see that way when we get into viagra into leviticus there's a scholar of the languages and he said that the word covenant also 
has several meanings. So when we're seeing Brit in here, we're seeing the covenant, we're seeing the cutting of the covenant. We know verse 18 tells us that God kept covenant. We know we're on the right track. And he gives these three meanings to the, the word for covenant. One is to eat, which suggests fellowship or agreement. That's what I just told you about eating after the sacrifice has been given. The second meaning for covenant is to bind or to fetter, which means you're making a commitment, you're tying yourself to this. And the third is to allot, which suggests sharing. So now you're looking at a covenant where at least two are coming together, they've cut together, they've eaten together, they've had that fellowship together, and they are committing themselves together to be part of this covenant together. Now, the one very interesting thing is when we have the Spirit of God go through the animals, Abram is asleep. He's not participating in that part because we have an unconditional covenant. We don't have that it's dependent on both sides. We have God saying, no matter what you do, I will keep my covenant. So here's that little bit of difference. But other than that, we see when God enters a covenant, he's entering to an agreement to commit himself to what he's promising. He's not just saying it and going to leave it and, and what happens, happens. He is personally involved to see to it. And that is nothing but pure grace. Not deserved not merited, earned in any way. And again, I'm reminded of Noah's covenant, where in chapter 9 and verse 11, when we were there, we read, I will set up covenant of me with you, and not or neither shall all flesh be cut off any more from the waters of the deluge or of the flood to destroy the earth. And in the Hebrew, we have the words berit, and we have the word karat. And by the way, if you see an H on the end, don't let that throw you. It's just however it's being translated from Hebrew into English. So God is saying to Noah, I'm going to cut covenant with you. I'm going to keep my covenant. It's unconditional. I won't destroy this world again with a flood like I have done now. And he gives the rainbow as a sign. So again, now God's cutting a covenant with Abraham and he's giving a sign. And we're beginning to see that sign in his name. We've got the fact that he is promising himself to be faithful. He will be their God. He will give Abram offspring. He'll give them the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. Hello, world. Wake up. Who does it belong to? <laughs> and when you've created it, then it's yours to give to whomsoever you please. Okay? And... The cherry on top, the crescendo, the most important part, so it's more than just the cherry on top, because on a Sunday you can take the cherry away. You still got the Sunday, but you can't take this away. The peak, the highest, the best, is he says, I will be your God. That's a promise, and they, he's promising them a blessed nation, a promised land, because he is going to be their God. He's putting his name on it. Now, all of that is exciting. All of that is, is, wow, what a covenant he is cutting with Avram. And I also like the idea that that cutting into stone that I brought out makes me think how with Moshe, there's going to be a covenant on stone. But with Avram, it wasn't cut in stone. It's cut in something else. I see heads going. You know exactly where I'm going. When we get to the sign of this covenant, we're going to be talking about a cutting called circumcision. This is upfront and personal, and there's no other way to, to tell you, but to tell you that this is a covenant in the flesh. It was a constant reminder. How do you get your offspring without me getting too graphic? You see your circumcision when you're making your offspring, okay? And if you don't understand, Go back to school because I'm not going to go with it anymore. But God is proving that it's he, reminding them he's cutting this covenant. He's producing this offspring and ultimately the seed that matters because that seed is miraculously born. We can see all of that in this name change at this time when God's covenant with him. 
Now let me also bring to you what that letter hey means in our Hebrew, okay? And usually it's spelled H-E-H, -E but you say it just like hey that you feed an animal or hey you, <laughs> okay? Hey. When you say hey, you can even hear the sound, okay? And it's supposed to represent the breath. It's supposed to be like a breathing out. God breathed into Adam and he became a living soul. We know that. And here, what God is saying in essence is, Avram, I'm breathing into you. I'm coming into you in a new way that's going to produce this that's going to come from this. And it's really, it, it's a wow. It's an upfront, it's a personal. The, the ultra-Orthodox says that the hey has three definitions. The first is, here is. Okay, it's now. The second meaning is to be disturbed. And it doesn't have to be a negative disturb. Usually we use the word that way. If I disturb you, I'm, I'm bothering you. But we can stir up the waters and we can say we disturb the waters. And if you're wanting a bubble bath, you're going to disturb those waters well. <laughs> and you're going to enjoy the result. So disturb doesn't always have to be a negative. But here is it. It's to disturb, it's to change something. It, it's shaking up something, it's changing something. And the third meaning they give to the letter H is the word behold. <laughs> and we know what God means when he says behold. So when he's adding H and he's adding the breath into Avram, he's coming in and now. He's changing everything. He's shaking it all up. But he's saying, don't miss it. Behold, I am your God. I will be with you. I promise you offspring. I promise you the seed. I promise you the land. And I promise you it forever. Wow, that's a covenant. That needs some sort of special sign. And what better sign than for God to not cut it on stone, but to etch it personally, to cut it personally into the very being of the person that will be a constant reminder. We'll always see that and always remember that and always know where this is coming from. How do we get children? They're a blessing from the Lord. It's not just, oh, nature takes its course. Everyone is a blessing from the Lord. Well, since you... I mean, explain it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get a whole lot more meaning out of a name change? Yes, yes. And is that fitting to the scriptures that we're talking about? Yes. When we get to 17 and we see the actual name change, you're going to come back in your mind to 15 and say, Ketty Covenant, I remember God promised. Here it is. Because he doesn't get Yitzhak tomorrow. He doesn't get him a year from now. He ends up with Ishmael before he ends up with Yitzhak. And Ishmael is 13 when Yitzhak is born. So it's time. There's going to be time still. But God has breathed in. He's brought a change. He's cut covenant. He's put his sign on it. You're going to see that every time, Avram. And you're going to remember. And you're going to know. And that, I think, is why it had to be so personal. Um, and, and we also know it is... It's God, when God breathes in, it becomes alive. If God had breathed in, this covenant wouldn't be alive because remember, it's unconditional. It's all dependent on God. So I see a whole lot more meaning. I'm looking to see if I've told you everything. It's a profound sign for a profoundly new, new thing. It fits when out of this covenant comes Mashiach, comes the Messiah comes the miraculous virgin-born son that's been promised even before. That's amazing. And by the way, circumcision of the heart, when that happens, there's a cutting, there's a new thing that happens, it's a new creation, and it's given a new thing. When they have the circumcision of their babies, that's when they're given their Hebrew name. They're given their new name. We have circumcision of our hearts. When we get to heaven, we'll know the new name that our Lord has given us. Because he tells us in Revelation 2, he has a new name for us. A name that's just between ourselves and God. Not that others can't hear, I don't know. But it's just, he's upfront and personal. I, I, it, it just, it lights me up that God gives me a new name. <laughs> I love my name, but I want to know what God's naming me. 
and I want to know why and what all is behind that because you can see God has meaning in everything he says. So I think I have covered, again, I'm looking real quick to see if I left anything out. We're saying that the sign that accompanies is circumcision uh, to be the constant reminder. Uh, I think I'm not seeing anything else. I think maybe I have, there's so much in this. I could probably teach it again and come out with something else and you'd say, I didn't hear that the first time. And I'd say, well, probably because I missed it, <laughs> getting it out. But I think we've got it. Are there any questions, any comments, any, are you good? Do you see why I've taken time to take you down this path? And do you now understand why it's not Ab Hamon? Father of a multitude is Avraham. And I see in that very much that it's um, the exalted father who God breathed in and kept covenant with. That's what I think his name means. What a name. What a name. Like I say, I want to know my name. <laughs> okay, I'm not seeing comments or questions. I'm getting my notes on all of these other um, things. I could, yeah, I could go on. I could go on. I've got a whole message on the Abrahamic covenant and how important it is, but I we're here for Genesis. We're not here for one thing, so I think unless you all bring something to my attention, I think I'm ready to set it aside. I have a question. Yes. Does the uh, Jewish people still practice this? They do the circumcision on the eighth day if they're Orthodox Jewish, yes. The, the religious that are trying to follow the scripture, absolutely. They have a, a very special ceremony. Um, they have a special, he's called a Moel, who does the, the cutting. He has the skill of the doctor. They do it on the eighth day according to the scriptures, and it's very interesting that on the eighth day, the blood is able to coagulate, and it's not able to before that. And I also understand that the properties of um, K, um, vitamin K, I guess I should say, I want to call it special K, but that's the cereal, uh, um, is also produced in the blood now at this point. So we can see God gave health reasons why they waited for that eighth day. It, very interesting. Um, they, they, there's something else too in there. It'll come back, or when we get to it, I'll, I'll come over it again. But yes, it's a very special day, and even though that baby's been given a name on the first day, just like we all do, a name written on the hospital certificate, and the name that the child is called usually, sometimes they, they give that same name, but very often, most of the time, is a different Hebrew name. And they usually try to make it what they want the character of the person to be. Like, remember when Leah named Judah, she was praising God. And so she used that, and it was hoped that this child would be a child praising, a child who would praise, you know. So they, they pick carefully, and sometimes nowadays they bring it down, and they'll, they'll pick names that our other family members have departed before in honor of them. But definitely, um, and sometimes that's the first name, and then they give it a Hebrew name. Uh, so in their ceremony, do they explain it like you just explained it to us? Probably not in as much detail. My understanding more, and it's the men who get together. The women can be on the outskirts of it. In the olden days, the women got nowhere near it, but now they let them in a little bit. Um, my understanding is that um, it's a community, you know, your congregation that you're a part of, that takes part in this ceremony. And the men, because they're the ones gathering around, and because it's their role to be the leader in the homes, the fathers that are there, each one takes a turn after the, the baby's been circumcised, each one takes a turn picking the child up, holding the child up, and in essence speaking over this child. What they will do, what they'll pour into this child's life, how they will help guide this child, how they want this child to follow Hashem, the name that, that they use for God. And so it definitely is a committing to God ceremony, um, kind of like our, our dedication, kind of like that. So I think they speak more to that because they expect all of them to know by the time they're, they're old enough to be fathers and to be adults around watching it happen, they've learned in their schools, they've learned in their training what this means and what it's about. Do they take it, draw it on the name Abraham? Maybe some of the really religious, the rabbinical line, maybe they're talking more about it, but I have a feeling it, it, it loses a little of the translation, probably. <laughs> but very good question. Yeah. Thank you. Sure.
Any other questions, comments? Are you too cold? Do I need to turn the heat up? No. No, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry, had to ask a side note for the house. <laughs> in, in and out. <laughs> yeah, well, that win. Yeah. Okay, then I think we are ready for chapter 16 because the rest of 15, when we looked at it, we saw last time that it gave the, the geographic locations. Remember, the boundaries of the land God promised to Israel are far larger than she has today. That we're looking at 300,000 square miles. We looked at it, went from the river of Egypt, and we agreed that even though there's other ideas, we all believe it's probably most likely the Nile. That goes from the Nile to the Euphrates, and that covers Egypt, Israel, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, possibly part of Iran, and Arabia, as in Saudi Arabia today. Huge land. That's all what was being promised. The ones that are in that land are the Canaanites, Canaanites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Raphaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. And I did not include the termites, as someone once said. <laughs> the termites were not allowed in. <laughs> okay? But these that I just named are all going to be pushed out also. Their cup of evil, the iniquity, sin, rebelliousness against the Most High God comes to the point that God says... I'm kicking you out. It was God's choice. And he said at one point, the ones that the Amorites that weren't out yet, he said, you know, you're not going to kick them out today. The cup of iniquity isn't full yet, but you will. That day will come. And it did, and they did. Um, we saw last time, so you can listen to the class before, where these people settled, but we saw them north, we saw them south, we saw them in the middle of the land. The, uh, the Jebusites were the ones around Yerushalayim, and we know they weren't totally pushed out like they were supposed to be. God told them to destroy all. But you have David, David, many years later, about, about 1,000 B.C., and we're at like 2,000 B.C., so like 1,000 years later, just in round figures. You have David by the temple area from the Jebusites. So they were still around, but they shouldn't have been if, if Israel had done what she was supposed to do. Anytime she left something behind, she paid the price, and then all the way down to today. And we are going to see in the background of chapter 16, which I think we're ready for now. We'll go into 16. We are going to see that uh, they don't always do everything according to the word of God. And there are consequences. When I look at the background building up to chapter 16, we're going to see the testing of Abram's faith and the character to this point. Let me show you that, that six times so far I can say he's gone through testing to test his faith and his character. Remember, God does not test to fail you. That is not his intent. And any good teacher, that's never their intent. But God allows the testing or brings the testing to reveal to us, to ourselves, where we need improvement, where our character needs to be formed more by God and less in, you know, in our own flesh. There's no other way to say it. So Auburn's gone through a lot of testing. We've seen that he is considered one who is great in his faith. God showed him the gospel and the stars. He believed it was accounted for righteousness. We said that's Avram's faith. He had faith in that coming seed. Even though he didn't even have a first child, he had faith. This is going to happen. I see his day, I believe. So we saw and we called him a great man of faith. We know overall he's called a friend of God. But we're going to see he's human too. And I'm thankful the scripture shows that. I'll be brutally honest. I'm thankful that I'm not living in the days of scriptures being written and that my dirty laundry might have been included in that out for people to talk about 2,000 years later. But I am glad that God put in the good, the bad, and the ugly because we can relate and we can be encouraged and we can be strengthened. When Avram has a, a setback, an oops, a boo-boo, whatever you want to call this in this chapter, God doesn't say, okay, you had your chance, kick you to the curb, let me go find somebody else. No, God pulls him up short. He pays the consequences the rest of his life for it, and so do his children after him, because we have problems down to the day because of it. But God stayed faithful. God kept his word, 
And God continued with him, molded him, brought him back, made him. We see that all the way down, all through time. David, man after God's own heart. And yet we know he was a murderer, he was an adulterer and a murderer. And yet God said, a man after my own heart. Not when he was doing his, his wrongdoings. But he knew how to come back truly repentant, truly remorseful. And turn back to his God, pay those consequences and grow and move, you know, further. So it really, it, it's for us. It very much is for us. So when we look at Avram's faith, we look at his character, how has he been tested so far? In chapter 12, he was tested to see if he had the fervor. You know, if you're fervent for something, you, you want it, you're going to go for it, you, you, you're putting your whole self into it. I say, it's got me hook, line, and sinker. It's got the whole thing. In chapter 12, did he love God more than he loved the home he knew and his kindred? Because God said, get up, get out. Leave your home, leave your family, go. Didn't even tell him where, remember? But he had to step out on that faith that was, if God was telling him to go, it was for his best good and whatever God was taking him to. God would fill him fully for anything that he left behind. And I will tell you, anyone who is afraid of giving anything up for God. If you give that up, you will find either you won't feel like you gave anything up or God will fill it so much in a different way that it will be, your cup will be overflowing more than it ever could have been had you stayed with whatever that was that, that was so tugging at you. So was Auburn fervent? Yes, he was. He did get up. He did go. It took him a little time to get all the way, but he kept moving forward. Then we look at Avram's faith. Was it sufficient? Was he looking to God, the living God, the God who we call the God of Israel? Was he looking to this living God to supply all of his needs? Or was he depending on the circumstances? I'm going to hope that they're good circumstances. I'm going to hope that the sun comes out tomorrow. I'm going to hope. It's called propitious. I'm going to hope that, that it's going to be good circumstances. I hear people say that about karma. Oh, I've done something good, so I'm going to have good karma around me, and I'm going to reap the results of that karma, of that good deed. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. But what about Avram? We see in chapter 12 that his faith was strained. There was a famine. He did start to go down to Egypt to get help. Well, he did go down to Egypt to get help. And he got in trouble down there, and he realized he shouldn't have gone, and he turned back. So his faith was weak. It was growing. It didn't quite pass the test that he didn't stand strong and faithful, but he did come around, and he did come back, and he did grow in his faith, and the next time he was stronger and able to withstand. Did he have a faith that at the same time, even though he's looking at it to be sufficient, He's looking at it to be fervent. He's put his whole heart into it. Is he, is, is he humble in his faith? Or is he, hey, I've got it now. I'm, I'm, I'm the man of faith. <laughs> How do we see him? We see his humility in chapter 13. We see that when he, um, he has a problem with his nephew or, or whatever he is, his relative Lot, he doesn't say, okay, I'm going to divide the land, and I want all this for myself. In his humility, he said to Lot, you choose. You take what you want. If you want to go to the right, you go to the right. We'll go to the left. We'll do whatever you don't want. And, of course, one way looked very lush and, and very beautiful and very appealing, and the other did not have that draw. Lot chose it. Avram didn't fight with him when he chose it. He let him have it. Why? Because he had learned I can trust my God to meet my every need. I don't need that land. I don't need that, what I can see. I need my God, what I can't see. And we know God flourished him, and we know it was the downfall for Lot. Was his faith bold? We need bold faith, folks. We need to, to not cower. That's not faith. We need to be strong. Was his faith bold? Well, chapter 14, he had to go rescue Lot. He had to go hundreds of miles up north. He had to go against a number of kings. He had to bring in others to be allies with him. 
Did he show that kind of boldness? Would he dare attempt to rescue Lot from that powerful warrior that had snagged him and all that belonged to him? Or would he say, well, he made his bed, I'll let him lie in it. He t chose the wrong and, and he's paying the consequences. No, we see Avram was bold. He knew that God was with him. In the power of God's strength, he went and he brings back Lot and the family. He, he brings them all back. That also tested the, the love of Avram for his family. And it shows us his courage and his character. We see good character forming. And that also feeds into his dignity. Would he demean himself? Would he lower himself? Would he accept reward from the king of Saddam for the battle that he won for the king because he brought back the booty? Would he be greedy? Hey, I earned it. I fought. I'm the one that went and got. Yeah, I had a reason. I wanted my, my kinfolk safe. But I think I should get a great reward for that because I did the work. But no, he doesn't. He, he says to the king of Saddam, I don't want any of the riches. The men that went with me, I'll let them have what they've taken, the food, you know, and what they've taken, because they deserve reward. They came in and they fought, they did, and, and they deserve to, to receive for what they have done. But me, I'm not going to let you say you made me wealthy. I'm not going to let you say that you are the one who endowed me. I'm going to trust my God to supply all of my needs. And Yes, wealth was a big deal. Avram had had a lot of wealth. God blessed him, and he had even more. So his dignity was tested, whether he was doing for the right reasons and whether he would let the wealth of the world get his eye, whether he'd take the wealth from a human source or whether he would let God bless him with that wealth. And then his patience is being tested in his faith. Wow. Wow. Would he wait for God to fulfill his word in his own way, or is he going to take matters into his own hands? I think we know the answer here. So that patience is going to be, how, how do you find out about patience? Testing. Testing. There's just no other way. So the seventh way I would say is that his faith is being tested in that patience, but it's also going to be tested because the one closest to him, his partner, his, you know, the, the, the right hand, is going to make a suggestion in chapter 16. Is he going to listen to her? <laughs> or is he going to stay strong and patient and following God? I hear a chuckle over there. I think somebody knows the answer. <laughs> So, chapter 15, we see a great man of faith. Chapter 16, we're going to see unbelief. We're going to see doubt. We're going to see a little problem here. In chapter 15, what we've just come through, he believed in the Lord. He saw the gospel and the stars. All of this, he went through the covenant. He was faithful. He, he was strong in believing. In chapter 16, he's going to hearken to the voice of Sarai. He's going to listen to his wife. In 15, he's walking, I'm going to say, after the Spirit, being led by the Spirit. And in 16, he's walking in the energy of the flesh. They're going to take matters into their own hands, and they're going to make something happen. Ouch. Okay? Now, notice 15 is a peak. He's really on a high point. He's called righteous by God because of his faith. God's personally come down, kept covenant with them, the fellowship, the connection, everything, you know, I mean, this, this is huge. It's a mountain peak experience. And very often in our Christian lives, in our lives, maybe I shouldn't say Christian, but in our, our, our lives as believers, because that word Christian, others can think other things. Let me say as believers. Often, when we have a beautiful experience with the Lord, when we hit a mountain peak experience, when we've gone through a, a hard trial or a hard test and we've come out shining and the conclusion's there and it's wonderful, we've hit the crescendo, guess what happens on the other end? Whoosh. We have a letdown. We have a worn out. We have um, 
a moment that's easy to fall in weakness. And that's why I'm bringing it out. If you have a mountaintop experience, it behooves you. Recognize it, enjoy it, give the glory to the Lord in it, and then shore yourself up in your faith. Be on guard. Watch out. The enemy is going to come in. He's going to try to attack. He's going to want to steal that joy. He's going to want to tarnish where you're at. He's going to want to destroy the new level that you are with your God. And he's going to come at you in a way that it's, it's easy because he knows your weak points. He watches you. He knows you. He hears. And, and he's, he's going to come at you at a time when you may be just physically warm from the battle. And when we're physically tired, it's easy to let down and get ourselves in trouble. So it's a warning. It's what we'll see here with Auburn that I, what I believe did help him fall in his walk of faith. Now, he didn't get knocked out of his faith. Don't get me wrong. He just, he, has a, he hits a bump in the road. And he has to get over this hurdle. And he needs to get over it with God's help and not with his, in his own flesh. Eliyahu, Elijah. On Mount Carmel he takes on all the prophets of, of Baal he he you know calls out fire from heaven he destroys kills all of the the um, the false worshipers you know I'm saying this poorly read first Kings 18 and 19 start about midway in chapter 18 if you don't know the story I'm talking about Mount Peak experience he's taken on I think it's 700 if I remember right you can look you can look it up and see huge number. He slays them all. His God is proven supreme and reigning. And you would think, well, Eliyahu, you've got it made. You know how to call fire from heaven. You know how to take on more than your number. You know how to come out successful. What worry could you have? And in that very next chapter, we see that Jezebel, the queen, who is more wicked than the king Ahab, Ahab, says, I want him. And I want him now. And I want him dead. And Eliyahu takes off and he flees. And I've heard so many people shred Eliyahu's character. Oh, he fled from a woman. He was a little pansy. No, he wasn't. He was a great warrior for the Lord. He was a strong leader for the Lord. What I believe we have is a very worn out, a very tired Eliyahu. I believe that it was, I can't handle one more thing. Now, here's where the mistake came in. In that weakness, he should have just pled before his God, help, and let God shore him up, protect him, take care of him, do for him. But in feeling that fatigue, feeling physically spent, emotionally spent, mentally spent, and probably feeling he was spiritually spent, he ran. Why do I take this other view? Look what God does. Where do you read in there that God reprimanded him and said, what are you doing running away? And where do you see God have a negative attitude toward him? I don't see that. He feeds him. He takes care of him. 40 days pass. That's exhaustion, folks. <laughs> God gave him time out to let him build up his physical reserves to get his head back on straight. And then God spoke to him. He wasn't in, the, in the, the big manifestations. He was in the still, small voice where he spoke to him. And there's where he gently said after showing him, here's my power. I've rested you. I've fed you. I'm caring for you. Look at my power. Now, what are you doing out here? Let's get back to work. Yeah. And he sends him back into the fight, a renewed and a refreshed. I don't see him ever say, you deserve consequences that are negative. No. He understood his humanity, his frailty. He meets him in it. He shores him up. He puts him back in the fight. He doesn't say, yeah, you're right. It's too much for you. You can't do this. No, he says, I am doing it. Remember, it's me. And then what more? He gives him a partner in his fight because this is when Eli El El Elisha, Elisha comes into his life and the two of them do ministry together. That's a loving God. That's a caring God. So don't see it as that negative. 
Yes, he shouldn't have fled. He didn't have to flee at his God, but God worked with him in it, understanding where he was coming from. We have Yeshua himself in the flesh. He has just had a mountain peak experience. He's had the, the baptism that we read about, which was not what we do in baptism. Where do you see that Yeshua sinned and needed to show that his sins were being washed away, that he was going down into death as a sinner, being raised in a new life in, in the Lord? No, he is the Lord, and he was not a sinner. That was not his baptism. His baptism was the ceremonial cleansing, not that he was dirty, it's just called a cleansing, a, a ceremonial ritual that the high priest went through to outwardly show the purity that was needed for that role as high priest that he was now stepping into. As Yeshua was beginning his ministry that was going to culminate in him putting his blood on the altar, in him being the role of high priest and sacrifice, everything that we need, go read Hebrews chapter 8, 9, and 10, the better, 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 better blood, better sacrifice, Everything that's being said as he was stepping into that role, the ceremonial washing that took place was to help the Jewish minds realize he is stepping into his priestly role. He's grown up now. It's time now. And he is the greatest high priest. That's why he's called the Kohen Gadol, the great <clears throat> high priest. But right after that mountaintop experience where he has such a closeness with God the Father, that you hear God the Father speak out of heaven when he came up out of the waters. He spoke and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. There's another time he even said, listen to him. But here at this point, this, my beloved son, I'm well pleased. Wow, wouldn't you love to hear heavens open up and God say that about you? And hear God saying it about the Son of God. And when you see that the dove came down, the dove that was that lit on him, we know that that was a picture in symbolic form of the Ruch HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. The triunity of God showed up in that moment because it's the triunity of God that's involved in our salvation. Yeshua carried it out in the flesh. But God the Father and the Spirit of God all are part of our salvation, even to the fact that we are sealed this day by the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, to go into the presence of our Father in heaven, Yehovah, who cannot let us into heaven until that blood from Yeshua was put on the mercy seat in heaven so that our sins are not just being covered, they are being washed away in the blood of the Lamb. So we have a beautiful picture here. It was an absolute highlight. I am sure Yeshua in his humanity ached to be in that close presence with his father, Jehovah, because what do we read he did constantly? He went up into the mountain and prayed all night. He got away from the crowds so he could have time with his father. Can you imagine? They've lived in eternity together, and now in his human flesh he has been separated, yet he knows that fellowship in a way that, that we're grasping and wanting, but we need to come into the fullness of it too. So anyway, back on point, here right after his highlight of, of hearing his father in heaven exclaim that, that I'm proud, I'm pleased, pleased with him. And all of that that I've just said, the very next thing that we read is Yeshua goes off into the wilderness alone and Satan comes to Okay, the word that popped up in my mind was torment him. It's supposed to be tempt him, but I think it was torment. <laughs> and we know that, that Satan came at him in every way that is common to man to be tried. That you can break it down into categories, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Everything that, that Satan, even to the point that he says, I'll give you all the kingdoms of this world if you'll just bow down and worship me. You don't have to go to that cross. I'll give you a shortcut. It's mine because he did. He, he had the rights to this kingdom called earth because Adam, Adam gave it to him when Adam disobeyed God. And this had originally been Satan's camp and that's what he was trying to gain back. And so really Adam handed it over to him. Yeshua had to come in the flesh to be the perfect Adam to, to purchase it back by his shed blood so that the victory is for mankind in the shed blood. So Satan came at him in real ways. 
Satan offered him what would tempt the flesh of Yeshua. And yet, he's the prime example. He didn't run. He didn't give in. He didn't make any mistakes because he was the, and is the Son of God. And he passed all those tests. And then the angels came and they ministered to him. Why did the angels come and minister to him? Because by that point, 40 days, no food, no water, physically, death would have been setting up. He would have been in the, what is literally called starving to death. So this, this is uh, a great example to us, again, of where Yeshua succeeded. We've got to plug into him to succeed in our tests. But that's what we're to do is plug into him and allow him to enable us and bring us up so our tests can become a testimony. Our mess can become a message. And that's what's going on. So Avram, yes, sorry, we're going to see he steps in it. But God's not going to be through with him. Let's go on and let's see how it happens. Okay, verse 1. Now Sarai, Avram's wife, um, it's not Sarah yet. We're going to have that H sound change, God breathing into her. We're going to have a new character. We're going to have a change. It's not yet. Okay, now Sarai, and remember Avram is still Avram. He, he's not Avraham yet, although we're going to see his name reflect all of this that, that has God has shown him. He is kind of covenant with him and so forth and so on. So we've got their names. We understand now Sarai, Avram's wife, had not born him a child. Remember, they've been told there's going to be an offspring. You're going to have a child. And it hasn't happened yet. But she had an Egyptian slave woman whose name was Hagar. Okay, a slave woman or a handmaid, whatever your, your translation says. This is a female slave, and no doubt she probably got her when they went down to Egypt because she's Egyptian. So how else did she get into the picture here? She probably, remember, Avram was sent out with wealth from Egypt. The, the king said, you know, you shouldn't have um, allowed Sarai to be compromised. Get her out of my house. Get out of my kingdom. But bless you as you go, and he gives them a lot of wealth. And in that was maidservants and men servants. So most likely that's where Hagar came into the picture. So she is Sarah's, Sarai's um, handmaid or, or slave woman. So Sarai, verse 2, said to Abram, See now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please. Have relations with my slave woman. Perhaps I will obtain, obtain, I'm sorry, children through her. Okay, before we get what Abram does, let me break this down. She says, the Lord's restrained me. The Lord has, has prevented me. It's chapter 16, verse 2, if you're lost. The Lord has held this back. I hear in her words, impatience. Did the Lord come to Sarai? Did, she, did he come to Avram and say, I'm not going to fulfill? I'm not going to do it? No, no. That's still on the table. The last thing they've heard is, I will. And here we see her impatience, and her impatience has led to discouragement, and finally, I think, to unbelief. She should have said, nature's failed me, but God is my resource. I have a feeling this probably is near the time where she realized even though she was older, she was so much older now, her body was as good as dead now, there wasn't a chance to have children now. She thinks it's all over. She's ruling out the miraculous. She's looking at the flesh. And that's where, like I said, she should have said, okay, nature's failed me, but God of nature, he can, he can reverse, he can change, he can do something. But even Proverbs um, 13, 12 tells us that the pain of hope deferred makes the heart sick. That means when you hope for something for a long time and it doesn't happen and it doesn't happen, you finally get heart sick. And that's what we're seeing. It's the pain of unanswered prayers. It's also for her probably the pain of public shame because it was a shame if you were not producing offspring, if you were not having children. There was something wrong with you. But we also see that she blamed God for her problem. She did not look to him for her solution. And unbelief is a sin. God does not give us the right to unbelief ever. It will make us sick. 
and it will carry with us a lot of pain. So this is where she's at. She's feeling the shame, the embarrassment, the hopelessness. Her body's not producing right now. She can't have children. She knows that God said they're supposed to be, so we got to do something about this offer. And she, in essence, felt like she had to intervene and help God. Now, she doesn't say, I'm going to help God out, but that, in essence, is what she does. And too often, we do the same thing. When we take things into our own hands, well, God hasn't done it yet, so I guess I better do this and so. And usually when we think and say those things, we're in for a big mistake if we follow it through. If you're thinking that, let that be the restraint that holds you back. Say, oh, whoa, wait a minute. Now I'm getting in God's way, and I'm running ahead of God, and I'm trying to make it happen because I don't want that trouble down the line that follows that. The hardest thing I think for us as humans is to wait. It's just, especially if the situation is getting more desperate, wait is all the harder. But uh, just as a side note, our partial, our portion of scripture we're reading this week worldwide as Jewish people, wherever you live, just happens to be the Red Sea in front, the Egyptian army, the hoofs that they're hearing coming behind them, the children of Israel caught in the middle of that. If there's ever a chance, that, a, a time to say, we can't wait any longer, it was now. Do we jump into the sea and drown ourselves, or do we let the Egyptian army come kill us and make slaves out of whoever they drag back? This is where Moshe, Moses gives them the wise words, stand still. I imagine they're looking, where can we go, where can we run, what can we do? Stand still. But then he doesn't stop there. He says, and see the salvation of the Lord. Moshe got it right. He gets a brownie point. He gets the crown. He heard God's voice. He knew God was going to rescue them. And if you've got the Red Sea in front of you, you've got the Egyptian army behind you, say hallelujah. My, re my redemption, my way open, the breakthrough, it has to happen now because it, it has to. There's no other choice. And look to God because God will not fail you. So in her wait, instead of looking to God and saying, you got to do something big now, God, because now we got more of a problem here, she takes it into her own hands. And she says, you know, that the Lord's prevented her, so let's do something about it have relations with my slave woman. Go ahead and do what you need to do so that you can produce offspring. Because that's the next words, perhaps I will obtain children through her. The Hebrew says that I might be built by her. She wanted to build her house, and that's the idea. Her name, she didn't want her name forgotten because she goes childless, and then the, there will be no one to remember her uh, as we go down the line. It would also mean that the household, the family would be cut off because Avram isn't going to have that offspring. And it was the custom of the day. Archaeological finds of records have proven this, that a wife who was barren could provide her slave to bear children with her husband, but the children would be considered the wife's because the slave doesn't have any right to anything. So the child would be adopted by the, the husband and wife and would become their heir. So what she's saying is, Hagar can produce the child, but then I will adopt the child. The ch I will be the mother to the child. Avram, you'll be the father to the child. And there's our heir. And we'll go on down through there. So that's what she's thinking that she should do. Now, I don't know this for a fact, but I have a question. Would Sarai have known of that custom or seen it in such a way that it's prevalent in her mind if they hadn't gone down to Egypt. I don't know. I don't know if that was the rule up in Mesopotamia or, you know, early Chaldees where they came from because they were, you know, they worshipped other gods. They were heathen ways. So I don't know. But somewhere along the line, Sarah has that thought, this is okay. This is the custom of the day. This is what we do. So Avram, I'm not able to have children. It's over. We all know what that meant. She's not having her cycle. It's over. Take my slave. Have a child. I'll adopt the child. We'll get this promised child. Okay, but God did tell Abraham he was going to have a child of his loins. Yes. He didn't say it has to be your wife. And you have the one excuse that people give Sarai. <laughs> that she could have said 
and she could have been thinking, God never said, Avram and Sarai, you will have a child out of your loins. He spoke it to Avram. So, it doesn't have to be me. Here's my handmaid. Let's get it on. I'm tired of waiting. I'm getting older by the day. It's going to be harder to chase that little one around. You know, let's get going before you're dead too, Avram, you know, <laughs> and not able to do it. Yes, that is absolutely a thought that she could have justified herself by saying that. That, you know, God never said it had to be me. Maybe we thought amiss. Maybe we expected it this way and it was intended to be that way and that's where they should have gone in prayer together gone to God and say is this your will I'll counsel you a million times stop pray and listen pray pray listening can I say that so you understand what I'm saying you know excuse me. I thought there was some place that he said it was gonna be Sarah not at this point oh, oh. Okay. Oh, <laughs> yeah. See, you have the disadvantage of knowing the whole story. <laughs> but when we keep it in order, no, at this point, it has not been, it was just through Avraham that it was, okay. it was said. So, what happens? Okay, she's put out the, hey, I've got a plan. I'm going to make this happen. I've got a plan. Please, have relations. I'll obtain children through here, through her, I'm sorry. And Avraham, man of faith, Head of the household says, uh 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 Sarah, that isn't how God said it. I'm gonna, you know, let me at least go ask God first. He doesn't do any of that. It says that he hearkened, he listened to the voice of his wife. He should have waited on the Lord. He should have gone to the Lord and it got counsel from the Lord of whether this was the will or not. So verse um, chapter 15 we see his faith, chapter 16 we see that his faith fails in patience. He's not patient to wait on the Lord. <laughs> We're told in scripture, and then I'll get your question, Roger, faith and patience inherit the promises. Now granted, he didn't have these scriptures, we do. He didn't have the example, we do. But remember, God walked with him, God talked with him, God showed him the gospel and the stars. He had a relationship with God. What happened to him talking to God? He should have talked to God before he took action. Look at these verses, Hebrews 6. Because we don't have the privilege of sitting down, having a meal with the Lord, mm -hmm. and having him talk to us face to face like we do with each other. I would love that. Spiritually we can, and there are ways that you can feel that you've been taken up into his presence and had a whole meal with him. And it, 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 wow, that's all I can say is wow. But in Hebrews, and I'm going to go to Hebrews chapter 6. Okay, let's chapter try that six. again. Chapter 6, yes, Hebrews. here we go. Hebrews chapter Hebrews. 6, we're going to look at verse 12. Hebrews 6, 12 says, So that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So here we're told, you, you've got a promise from God, follow the example. Stand in faith, believing, and be patient. Two parts to that. Look at chapter 10 in Hebrews 6. I'm sorry, in the book of Hebrews. Go past chapter 6, go to chapter 10, and look at verses 35 and 36. Hebrews 10, 35 and 36. And here we read, Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which is great reward. If God's given you a promise, you've been standing on it, you're standing on it by faith, you're saying, God, I believe you, I believe you said this, I believe you will do this. Don't throw that away. Be confident in the Lord, because He is faithful. And so we go on from verse 35 to, um, oh, I didn't even finish 35. Don't throw away your confidence which has great reward. You will get rewarded for your, your confidence and your faith in the Lord. Verse 36, for you have need of endurance. You know what endurance is? When you're enduring, it's not easy. You're, you're just, you're the little engine trying to get up that hill. You're just having to put one foot in front of another. It's a struggle that you're enduring. You're doing it so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. 
See, we don't know the whole picture. There's a reason why God's put that delay in. There's a reason why it's not coming together yet. We may never know on this side of heaven, but trust and put your faith in him. Stand strong. If he says stand still, stand still. If he tells you wait on him, wait on him. He will come through. Your faith and your patience will get rewarded. He won't leave you hanging. You may feel like it, but not forever, okay? So... He listened to Sarai. Adam listened to Eve. Now, I'm not throwing the wives and the women under the bus, okay? <laughs> but what we're seeing is don't listen to human voices. Don't listen to human reasoning. You need to get it from God, not from those around you. You can have wise counsel in people. Go to those who are going to scripturally counsel you. But even when they do, take what they're counseling you and go to God and say, is this your will? Is this right? Don't just presume, oh, they're a person of, of God. They've got it. Because you have to weigh it. You're responsible in your own life. Abraham had no one to blame but himself. He's going to be pulled up short because he heeded to the voice of Sarah. He's, he's the head. He could have said no, but he didn't. Each one, really, both Sarai and Avram, acted in unbelief. Avram following through and doing the act, Sarai in saying, hey, we got to do something about this, so go and do this. And some will even bring out the example here, too, that, that we do see in Scripture there were polygamous, polygamous marriages, but we don't see them ever happy. We don't see that this is God's way. We see that there are reasons. They shouldn't have picked up a handmaid that became like a wife. Okay? So here we are now. We're going to go back to Genesis 16. We're going to go back to verse 3. Yeah, I did all of two. Avram listened to the voice of Sarai instead of the voice of God. Verse 3, and so after Abram had lived 10 years in the land of Canaan, we've got times passed, okay? He's been 10 years now. So it wasn't that Sarai got impatient in a year or a few months or even five years. It was 10 years. It's been a long time since God in chapter 12 said, I'll make nations come from you. I'll make a multitude out of you. So it had been, the testing had been long. I'll admit that. After Avram had lived in the land of Canaan for 10 years, Avram's wife Sarai took Hagar, the Egyptian, her slave woman, gave her to her husband Avram as his wife. Sarah had control over her. Hagar did not have a say in it. Sarai is the one who said, you're my slave. This is what you are to go do. So, um, and, and by the way, just to give you age, also because um, Avram was 75 when he first entered into the land of Canaan, He's now 85, and we don't know how soon in that time he went down to Egypt when he picked up Hagar, we think, you know, chapter 12. But imagine Hagar's been there for a while. I don't think it's, you know, somewhere in that 10 years, this all transpires. But what we see about Hagar is she's going to be a type of the law. The law will bear children of bondage under the law. You're bound by the law. You have to keep the law. Galatians 4, let me read it for you because there's a lot that we will build on this as we go on. Um, not necessarily today, but it's a good ground marker to lay down. Galatians chapter 4, verse 22, I believe is where we're going to start. Where did my note go? Yes, Galatians 4, verse 22. We read here, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman, one by the free woman. Okay, the bondwoman, the slave, is going to be Hagar. He's going to have a son by Hagar. We're going to know that his name is Ishmael. Then we're going to know that he has a son by Sarah. Sarah, he's going to have Yitzhak, the virgin. Well, in essence, I mean, Sarah wasn't a virgin, but she couldn't conceive anymore. God miraculously... Uh, uh, Isaac's miraculously born. However you want me to say that, okay? Um, and that's because she received that son through promise. Now, here in Galatians, he says, this is allegorically speaking, for these women are two covenants. Now, we already have seen the covenant of grace with Noah, 
We're seeing the covenant of the and the promise, the unconditional. God's going to keep it with Abram. We see that there are different covenants. Moses is going to be a covenant of law. They're going to be bound by the law. And that's what he's showing here. These women are two covenants. One proceeding from Mount Sinai. The law. That's what took place on Mount Sinai. Is That's where they got the law. The Ten Commandments only they get a lot more than that. Okay? The one that the proceeding from Mount Sinai bearing children who are to be slaves. They're slaves of that law. Keep that law or you're in trouble. You're cut off. You, you lose your life even. That's a picture of Hagar. Hagar is a slave. She has to go by that law. Now this is, in verse 25 says, it, this is Hagar. Uh, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Yerushalayim, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above, so the children in Jerusalem, they were still bound under law. And they're, they're thinking even to this day, the Orthodox Jew is trying to adhere to the law. They're bound by this law. They've not been released because they're looking earthly. And even in the present Yerushalayim, Jerusalem on earth, they're in slavery to that. But the Jerusalem above, the heavenly Jerusalem, that one is free. That one's our mother. Remember, our citizenship is in heaven. Our father is in heaven, our home. And we call our homeland our motherland. That's what we're saying. We're of the Jerusalem in heaven. That's the spiritual. And that's where we see that there is a difference because this one is free. She's our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, barren women who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor, for, no more, for more numerous are the children of the desolate than the one who has a husband. And it goes on from there, and it talks about Isaac is going to be out of promise, and it continues on. So we see that, there's, that we're drawing two pictures. Slave, bound the law, <coughs> earthly. Then we see the, the free women give birth by a promise of God, and we see heaven. The spiritual promises that are ours. So Hagar is going to show us that law, that life that's bound, the flesh that's bound. Sarah is going to show us grace. We're going to see that it's life and, uh, under the unconditional promise of God. God gives to us salvation by his grace, not by our earning it. Under law, they had to try to earn their salvation. They had to make the sacrifices because they couldn't earn it. But by grace, represented by Sarah, she's going to get it out of promise, and God's going to do it. So the two covenants are very distinct. With Hagar, God had nothing to do with it. It was all man's doing. And with Sarah, man had nothing to do with it. Sarah's body is good as dead. Abraham's body is good as dead. God does it. Very big difference between the two. We, in our faith, in our God, are children of grace. We are under his grace. We are the free women, not bound to the law. Okay? Roger, I almost forgot. You had a question or comment. I'm sorry. Well, you did cover at one point. Oh, okay. Said he should have known. What did Adam do? He listened to his wife. Maybe I shouldn't do this. <laughs> Roger saying the, the example that he should have learned from Adam not to listen to his wife. But then I will take you through the scriptures that we just did in our Bible study on Tuesday, so it's fresh in my mind. Nabal, not Nabal, I think you guys say, he had a wife by the name of Abigail, Abigail, and when Nabal did not do right, Abigail saved his neck at that point. God takes his life from but she steps in and does right by, by David, who was um, God's anointed and God's choice. And she spared the whole, uh, David was out to, to kill his whole household and all his slaves, all, all his uh, warriors with him because he had, he had um, not helped David. He'd come against David. It's a long story. <laughs> Go read First Samuel 25, okay? Yeah. And you'll get all the details there. But my point being, Needed to listen to the wife there. Yeah, because if he didn't, there would be no Arab nation either. Well, God brought the Arab nation out of, but not because he listened to his wife. Well, no, no, but yeah. Yeah. yeah God, God supersedes. Mm -hmm. He's in control. His program's not ruined. He's right. not, uh-oh, now i got a problem. What yeah. am I going to do? I've got this little offspring that I didn't count on. No, no. 
God, God knew, God planned, and God said that he would bless, and out of Ishmael would come nations. He, it was not, you know, a curse and, and all of that, no. But notice the difference between law and grace, okay? <clears throat> law addresses man. Man sets down rules. We've got the law of our cities. You disobey that law, if you get on the streets, and you speed, you can get a ticket and have to pay a ticket. You have to obey that law or there's a consequence. Too bad we don't do that with all our laws and make people live more right. But anyway, we set down rules by law. The law will test man. As soon as you, want, let me put it this way. If I put up a sign that says, wet paint don't touch, what do people do? Of course. Oh, I gotta touch it. Oh, it is wet. <laughs> you know? And now your little fingerprint's there for proof of who did it. Because <laughs> fingerprints don't lie. But it, it's just, it's man's simple nature. As soon as you say don't, they've got to do it. You know, that, that's what we see. It tests man. Are you going to be obedient? Are you going to adhere to the law? It sees what that man is really worth. Are you worth your word? Are you worth your character? You know, do you have a good character? Are you going to be an upstanding citizen? Are you going to break every law? Are you going to see what you can get away with? Are you going to push as far as you can? It shows that character. It will prove every time, when we're talking about the law that was laid down, it will prove that every time man is a sinner. Man will end up in ruin. Give me one man who does not. Anybody? No, no. Well, yes, the the man okay. slash God okay. called Jesus, Yeshua. Yes, but outside of Yeshua, Jesus, absolutely none. And it puts every man under the curse. Every man curses a man who breaks the law. If you break even one commandment of the law, you're guilty of it all. And that's six hundred thirteen commandments, everybody. That's not just ten, okay? And it will keep him there until death. That's the punishment. The wages of sin is death. That's what law gets us. It gets us a bad grade, actually a failing grade, and it gets us a sentence of death. And there's nothing that law can do about it. Law will show us up every time because we cannot live perfectly. But here's where grace steps in. And we do not get salvation by law. We get salvation by grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. No man can say, I got my salvation. I earned it. I did it right. You all failed, but look <laughs> at me. Watch that one take a nosedive. So, back on chapter 16, verse 4, I think we're ready for in, in verse 3, Sarai has given Hagar to her husband Avram to be as a wife. So what's he do? He had relations with Hagar, and she conceived. And when Hagar became aware that she had conceived, her mistress, Sarai, was insignificant in her sight. What does that mean that Sarai now was insignificant? Hagar actually despised Sarah now. Her estimate of who Sarah was, maybe as a slave, she was looking up to Sarai because Sarai is a free woman and, and the slave is subservient. But now she's going to feel like she can even lord it over Sarai. We're going to see that. She's exalted in her own eyes. She thinks less of Sarai. Hey, the problem wasn't on Avram's part. I'm pregnant. The problem was on your part, Sarai. So she thinks she's got one over her right now. And there's going to be the beginning of many, many sorrows. We do reap what we sow. If they hadn't gone into Egypt, if they didn't have Hagar, they wouldn't have had anybody to turn to except God. That's the way it should have been. The culture realm was very, um, uh, what's the word I want? It, it was, it, childbearing was huge. Again, if you were not able to bear children, if you weren't mothering children, especially you've got a wealthy man, an influential man, and they even have servants, there's something wrong in this picture if you aren't able to produce children. They fully believe that, that God opens and closes the womb. Now, I don't know whether Hagar's faith was, but I believe that she had been introduced to the God of Israel, because we're going to see 
in a little while when she's in trouble with her son she cries out to God and God does meet her in a very real way and that's the God we're talking about the God of Israel the God of Abraham this is not a heathen God I'm gonna sneeze sorry <laughs> my nose is getting because of the wind I'm sure but um, it, it made Hagar feel like she had a greater status look at me you know I've got this wealthy man, I'm like a wife to him now, I'm producing children for him now, you know, Sarah, you can just go over in the corner and you can just, you know, and we're going to see a lot comes out of, of this that just, they're going to reap a lot of pain, a lot of sorrow, a lot of heartbreak, it's not going to be good, where Sarah must have thought, well, at least I'll have a child, yeah, well, Verse 5. Okay, let's look at verse 5. So, Sarai said to Avram, May the wrong done that may be upon you. I put my slave woman into your arms, but when she saw that she conceived, I was insignificant in her sight. May the Lord judge between you and me. <laughs> you know what she's doing? She's having a hissy fit. And she's not blaming herself for her part, her role in this. She is saying, Avram, it's your fault. <laughs> what do we often do? We're laughing, but don't we know? It would blame somebody else. I hear it in the courts today. I hear it on the news every night. I didn't do it. It's my mama's fault. She fed me too many Twinkies. Well, I didn't have a mama, so it's their fault. You know, it's always somebody else's fault. No, we've got to own up to our own problems. In the Hebrew, when she says the wrong um, that was done at the start of the verse, may the wrong done to me, the Hebrew actually says an injury, a suffering injury. I'm hurt. I'm suffering, and it's your fault fault Avram you did this it's your fault you should have done something she's passing the back okay and she says I put her into your arms now the Lord judged between you and me for doing this thing there might have even been an affection that she was seeing between Avram and Hagar now where Hagar had always been the slave and not in that position that you can imagine you know I'll just be a little graphic, but not too much, but Hagar's tummy has grown, and I've seen time and again, the daddy puts the hands on the womb and feels the baby kicking, they get excited, yes, yes, that little life is in there, and they start talking about when the baby's going to be born, and maybe they even had a conversation like, I wonder if he or she will have your eyes and maybe your <laughs> nose and maybe you know your skin color because there had been differences you know and Sarai would be feeling left out she would be feeling you know a, a hurt and an emptiness and a pain and in that pain she did lash out at Avra now she's upset at her husband you did it you did it and I could also see because of the character we see of Hagar she probably was having a blast. She probably was flaunting it. You know, here she's been a slave. Now she can lord it over Sarai. So, you know, oh, look at me. I'm carrying Avram's child and, you know, making a big deal out of it and making her little nest where she's going to keep the baby. You know, I mean, who knows? Who knows? But we don't have a happy household here, folks. We absolutely don't. And that's what polygamy will give you every time. If you are a man and you think, oh, I, I would like to keep two or three or four, yeah, take a look at, at Avram. Take a look at Jacob, who ends up with two wives and two handmaids. He's got to please four mamas. I think that was, <laughs> there may be moments of fun, but <laughs> there's a price to pay. So Avram shoots back. You know, they've got this conversation going. He says to Sarai, look, your slave woman is in your power. Do what is good in your sight. So he basically throws it back at her. And he basically says, do what you want. You know, he doesn't accept that, it, that Sarah's done something wrong and say, well, you know, this is wrong. He just basically says, you got yourself into this. You suggested it. You, you, your part to blame here at least, if not putting all the blame on her, I don't know. But when he passes the buck because he is that head who's supposed to be taking the lead, he, essence, is giving her that position. He's handing it over to her. You got yourself in this problem. 
do whatever you have to get yourself out of it, just do it, you know, and he doesn't take that head position that he should in the household to right the wrong in some way, to deal with the issue, and so we're going to have more trouble, because a wrong begets a wrong begets a wrong. It's like that you tell that little lie, and then you got to tell a bigger lie, and it just gets bigger, and it gets worse, and it gets worse. So, Sarai so says, okay, I can do what I want to her. I'm not happy with her. I'm not going to treat her nicely. Yes, she's pregnant. She probably needed a little TLC at times, but uh-uh. Sarah's going to come along, and she is going to treat her harshly. And that's what it says. So I treated her harshly, so harshly that, that Hagar flees from her presence. The Hebrew says that she was oppressed. So she now, in the midst of her trial, her circumstances, she wants to get out of it. She doesn't want to stick around. Rather than her looking to God for help and for God to bring good out of it for her because she, in essence, was innocent. She had to do what she was told. But we don't see her do that. We don't see her either admitting to, I've been treating Sarah badly. I'm bringing these attitudes you know, on myself. No, she just says, I'm going to get out of here. I got to get out. And she runs. 3.30. Okay, I'm going to introduce you to the angel of the Lord, but we're going to come back on the angel of the Lord next week. So let's just look at it a little bit more and we'll tie it up. Verse 7, now the angel of the Lord found her, this is Hagar, because Hagar has run off. She found her, he, I'm sorry, he, the angel of the Lord, he, forgive me, found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. So she's taken off, she's out in the wilderness. You know, we're not in the city. She didn't say, well, I'm going to go, I, I'll pay for a hotel room tonight, I'm going to yeah. put myself in a little luxury while things simmer down back at home. No, she takes off. I have a sneaking suspicion because, sure, the, the wilderness is south. I have a feeling she thought, I'll go back to my home. I'll go back to my people. I'm getting out of here. I've had enough of this. If this is the way I'm going to be treated, I'm gone. So I have a feeling that's where she was headed. It doesn't say it. She just says that she's fleeing from her mistress when she answers in verse 8. But I just kind of wonder, you know, where else would she go? She can't live in the wilderness. She's pregnant. She's going to need help. And who are you going to turn to for sympathy? Those who are going to be sympathetic toward you. Her family. She was taken away as a slave. Let me go back. You know, I could be wrong, but I, I kind of... I kind of wonder. So anyway, what we're going to have here is that the angel of the Lord, that's Jehovah, that he is going to appear to her. And when the angel of the Lord appears, it's called a theophany. The theophany is God being made visible in some sort of form, okay? Visible to humankind. I should make that clear. Because God is not like us. He is he is spirit. We do see him personified. We see Daniel. Daniel talk about hair like wool, eyes like blazing fire. We talk about how Yeshua takes out of the right hand of God. So we put God into our human form. Yeshua took on human form. God did not take on human form, but he re presents himself in a way that we can respond to and relate to. So in that way, when he appears, and this is before Yeshua took on human form, it will be called a theophany or a Christophany. Theo being God, Christ, Christ you know, uh, making this appearance. So when we say an angel of the Lord, we're going to say it's a theophany of Yeshua. We're going to say, you know, we've got both involved here. We'll kind of try to talk about is that Jehovah? Is that the Son? Because the Son's the one who takes on human form. That's usually the way we look at it and say this is the pre-incarnate Christ, is how we often say it in our English. It is the first mention of the Lord by this name. He's not been called the angel of the Lord previously in Scripture. And this distinguishes him from all other angels. This is not saying that he is just an angel. He's an angel of the Lord. That means angel is a messenger. This is a messenger from the Lord. This is Jehovah that's going to appear to man in an angelic form to bring a message. So we're going to see this message is coming from 
in essence, we're going to say it comes from God. You can say it comes from the Son of God before he took on the human form, however you want to put it. We know Jehovah and Yeshua are one and the same anyway. And remember, very often in Scripture, I do this. Are we talking about the Father? Or are we talking about the Son? And it's braided so well down that about the time you think, oh, this scripture is how God's defined because I see that definition here and here and here in these other scriptures, then it's going to pop in with something that says, oh, now wait a minute, that's how Yeshua is described. Which one is it? Well, if we can ask God when we get there. All we know is it is Yehovah coming in a form, angelic-like, with a message to give to Hagar. Now, do we see the angel of the Lord? Yes, we see the angel of the Lord many other times in Scripture. Um, I'm going to summarize them right now because I want to give you all these points, and I think that's probably where we're going to stop. Uh, actually, I can't even summarize it. I've got 13 places, and then I've got others that I'm going to say. I think what we'll do, and let me get your opinion, but I find the Angel of the Lord a very interesting study. I think that we might like to sidestep just like we did with Cutting the Covenant. See fully what the Angel of the Lord means. See the times when the Angel of the Lord has appeared in Scripture. What we glean from that. And then go on with chapter 16. It will not take a whole class. It will take some time um, of the next class. But by way of those who are showing me their faces and those who are in my live room is it a yes you'd like you know a little more in depth on the angel of the lord or am i just in something i'm interested in and not you really so how many want a little more on angel of the lord i've got one yes i've got how many do i've got two yeses okay how many knows how many do not want it and how many are saying, I don't know what you're even talking about? <laughs> or I don't care. <laughs> I'll wake them up. You're waking them up. You're, you're making me seasick. <laughs> he shook the camera if you couldn't see that. Okay, I'm not getting any negatives. And I think maybe because you all don't know, I think you'll find it interesting. I think I'll take you into it. If I see I'm losing interest, I'll hurry through it. But I think I will take you into it. So let me introduce you to, to the... I'll name these, but we'll go back and we'll look at verses and we'll see it. So, okay, then for that reason, I need to quit pretty quick here too. Give me two minutes to wind it up, okay, because okay? I do need to talk to you before you go. So we're going to see the angel Lord acting with mankind. He's going to stop Abraham from, from uh, taking his son's life, Isaac. We're going to see it's the angel Lord that speaks to Yaakov, to Jacob. We're going to see that he speaks to Samson's parents. Anybody even know Samson's dad's name? Oh, name? Uh-huh. He's named in Scripture. Yeah. We hear all about Samson, but his dad, I'd love to see what his dad saw. Oh, his dad. His dad. Oh. Samson's daddy. Samson's Abba. Just start with an E. M. Oh. It's Manoah. Well, I think I might have seen, nope, nope, because she's writing like that wasn't what she said. Manoah, okay, very interesting what he sees, very interesting. We'll look at that real quick and we'll see. We're going to see this angel Lord, I believe, wrestling with Jacob, with Jacob. We'll talk about is it or isn't it and how he redeems Jacob. Who spoke to Moshe in that burning bush? Hello, angel Lord. Angel Lord. Who protected them at the Red Sea? Angel Lord. We're going to see how he shows himself in all these different ways as we go through it. He commissions Gideon. He ministers to El Yahu. He reassures Yeshua. He saves Yerushalayim. That's his city. He put his name on it. And one that you will be familiar with, he preserves the three in the fiery furnace. Because remember, three went in, and yet they saw four walking in there. And not one of them was burnt. No, not a hair. They didn't even smell like smoke. That's amazing. And there's a few other examples I'll give too. But we'll look at this because I think it's exciting to see how the Lord enters into our circumstances in a magnificent way to reveal who he is. And as he comes as an angel, he's coming as a messenger. There's a message there. What's the message? So I think it's relevant to us. Um, give me feedback during the week. 
I can go long, I can go short. And otherwise, I'll just let the Holy Spirit guide me as we unfold. Comment, and then we'll close the prayer, mm -hmm. and then we'll open it up. When the three were in the furnace, didn't they say that the fork was like the men of some God? Or? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. How did they know that? Very good. <laughs> How did they know that? What made them say that? What Very did you good. say? They so said like that the fourth one who was in the fiery furnace looked like the Son of God. Why did they say that? Why didn't they just say it looked like a fourth man? It's a good question. Good question. Go do your homework. Let's see what you come up with. I see the wheels turning over here. Whoa, are they turning. I love it. I love it. You got something to work on all week now. How does the angel Lord appear? How did he appear? What made them say that? Can we answer it? Don't take a cop out. No, Go look in the scripture, yeah. study it, and see. The other ones. He never caught fire. <laughs> Watch the movie. <laughs> Did they? I he saw a man he last he night literally, literally split seconds from losing his life in his car. The, he had crashed his car. The police and a good Samaritan were trying to get him out. And they're running around the car, they're working, and literally they're, they've just begun to drag him. And I thought, because the video was right there, I thought his feet were going to catch fire as they were pulling his body out. It was that close. And they're hollering, you know, pull that further, 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 because the car went <sighs> literally seconds from his life being at least burned horribly. I, I would think he would have died in it, but at least burned horribly. What about those men? Were they, was the fourth one patting out the fire? <laughs> when we had the fire up here on the north end, my brother and, and my adopted brother here, Roger, were putting out fires. They were pouring water on here and here, and they're running to the neighbors and pulling off things that were catching on fire. Is that what was going on? No, I think he glowed. More Somebody says fire. he glowed. More than he glowed. Fire. Did he look like a woohoo? <laughs> we'll come back. We'll talk about however much we can. I'm going to close in prayer. You're going to hear me go off mic just for a moment. Talk among yourselves. Make your comments. I will be right back on, but I want to give somebody something before they run out the door. So, And they have an appointment they have to get to. So, Lord God, thank you for a class to open our minds and make us think to talk about the relationship <laughs> we can have with you. Lord, we want to have you in our lives up front and personal to see, to feel, to taste, to, to, to hear whatever I've left out where we want it all the way I We want to sit and have fellowship with you, have a meal with you, and just drink in all that, that you are and all that you have for us. Thank you for putting a hunger within us and fill us up, Lord. May we be satiated, not content with any one meal because just as humanly we need it again and again and again, may we eat at your word all week long and come back with an even already deeper understanding but open and ready to go deeper yet and closer to you. Reveal yourself in any way that you desire, Lord. May our spiritual eyes be open that we see and receive. And may we shine like you, reflect you, glorify you, be more like you, and take that testimony out to those around us. Thank you, Lord. Again, that's how you do it, because it's you who does it, and not we ourselves. And we praise you for that forever. In Jesus' name, amen.